Oh, by the way, it's actually Rochelle. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the podcast, everybody. This is Harmony, your podcast host. Today I have with me the wonderful Rochelle and we will be talking about how to cut the overwhelm and slow down. Rochelle is a slow living coach, host to the How to Live Slow podcast, wife and mom of two young boys. She once believed that you had to hustle for your goals, prove yourself through your achievements and have everything figured out by the time you're 30 or you'd miss the boat. Rochelle has changed her narrative and is now helping other mums do the same through her slow living movement. Welcome, Rochelle. Hi, thanks so much for having me. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on. I always start my episodes with my rapid inspiration questions. So if you could inspire us with what your superpower is. Well, you know, I think my superpower is why I started my business. And that is um, that I can help mums see their experience and, and what they're going through in a new way. Um, mm. You know, maybe shine a little the light on the things that they're, they're ready to, um, you know, accept. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And what is your favourite quote or mantra at the moment? My favorite quote comes from Carl Honoré and he wrote the book Power of Slow and it's much better to do fewer things and have time to make the most of them. Oh, wonderful. I actually um, read a beautiful one the other day talking about slow living and it was that nature is never in a hurry yet everything is accomplished. Yeah, exactly. I love that because with Ayurveda (laughs) we align ourselves with nature and the rhythm so it really spoke to me it was beautiful yeah that's beautiful I've shared that one plenty of times in my group (laughs) Ah, have you (laughs) yeah um and who or what is inspiring you at the moment I am really inspired by lots of women who are changing the way that the coaching industry is running um, there's Carly Marie I think she's amazing um, she's really uh, doing things a little bit differently and Sharon Holmes is a diversity and equity and inclusion coach and she really shares things that really again that superpower of like waking people up to new ideas and ways of seeing uh, the cliched you know parts of life <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely is yeah. Carly Marie the soul modes yeah, yeah yeah she wrote soul modes yeah yeah I actually interviewed one of her soul mode coaches the other day on the podcast so. oh so good I really like I really like her theories around soul modes yeah, yeah. They are fun yeah <laughs> and so what does an inspired life look or feel like to you um well an inspired life looks like um uh, not working towards achieving work-life balance anymore mm-hmm. you know for me um, my most amazing version of my life is when everything that I you know all of those parts of me are just one thing I don't have to wear the mum hat and the work hat Mm. and the wife hat and all of the other hats you know friend hat and everything I'm just fully me and Mm. all of those things come along with me Um, and I'm not trying to you know allocate my myself to bits and pieces um, everywhere so I love that you're just totally embodying who you are and all that comes with being yourself which is wonderful because it is like really easy to sort of have to feel like you have to constantly switch roles like you said wear all the hats and then that can become very unsettling yeah yeah amazing so I would love to find out more about your personal story with slowing down and why you created the how to live slow movement and what is it exactly Yeah, so I got into slow living, well, I started with minimalism and it was out of the necessity of um, I was living in an apartment. I met my, you know, boyfriend of the time who ended up being my husband. Um, He lived in an apartment and we kind of moved in together into this smaller house and we had to get rid of a lot of stuff. But what we discovered was, um, you know, combining two homes and having a smaller, you know, amount of money that we had to spend on rent or, you know, eventually our mortgage and everything um, meant that we had so much more, you know, we had a smaller space so we had less time to keep it clean and to look after it. We had more money left over for doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I really discovered like, 
you know, I grew up in an environment where you just, um, we, you know, on a farm and we always made the most of, you know, spending out time outside. We didn't have a lot. Um, and then I kind of moved to the city, went to uni, ended up accumulating all this stuff and realised how much better life felt when I finally got rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I realised as well that uh, he was, we'd started a business and he was working really hard. I was working full time and studying to finish my degree, degrees full time. And um, we wanted to start a family. And, you know, I knew that there was no way that I could fit, even with my minimalist kind of, you know, mm -hmm. um, heart, I couldn't fit being a mum into all of that. And so I think I realized that minimalism, you know, is all about, you know, well, it's not just decluttering, but slow living is actually about changing the pace of the way you do things. So, you know, I think, um, and so I just, I started to look into slow living a little bit more. I, I discovered Brooke McCallery's book, Slow, many years ago, um, or her podcast actually, um, and was like, oh, this is it. This is the bit that I'm missing. Like I've gotten, you know, I've decluttered. I'm starting to think more intentionally about my life, but actually I'm still hustling towards some end point that I never seem to get to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was approaching 30 and, you know, as you said at the start, uh, you know, I had, was traveling every year, you know, going overseas every year, but it just was like, because that was what I thought I wanted. Mm. And, you know, now I'm seeing even more with COVID, it's like, you know, we, we can't travel. And so it's like, when we get to again, I'm going to enjoy it so much more because it's not just something I do all the time just to tick a box. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the long version the, or the roundabout version. But um, yeah, that's kind of where slow living all started to come from. And then when the kids came along, I was like, you know what? I don't really want to go back to working full time. I don't want to send them off to daycare and I go off to work. And then, mm. you know, everybody's tired. So we don't get quality time on the weekend because we're just recovering from our weeks. Mm. All of that. Like, how can we enjoy our kids' childhood together as a family rather than wishing it away and working towards some next end point? You know, when they sleep through the night, things will get better. When they're going to school five days a week, things will get better. Oh, when they're, you know, nine, the attitude will be gone. So things will get better. You know, all of those. Yes, you're always chasing that that yeah. next goal, that next yeah. stage. And it's yeah. it things just start to accumulate and you, yeah. you get there and it's not what you expected or it's not, you know, there's always yeah. some new thing, you know, shiny object or yeah. stage in life that you want to get to. And it is, it's... Yeah it's hard to pull you out of yourself out of that because we are in that really fast paced modern world. We're in that sort of hustle yeah. environment. I think a mm. lot of us have sort of either been through burnout or on the brink of burnout and yeah. are being a little bit more aware of it these days, but yeah. not everybody. <laughs> and it's still very much that sort of like hustle environment. And yeah. when you do have children, like, wow, like your life does change and overwhelm and motherhood, they almost go hand in hand. It's, it's yeah. very difficult to find your feet with the new transition into parenthood. And you soon realize that you can't do everything that you once did, that you're hustling for, or at least that you really need to prioritize things. Yeah. So I guess with motherhood comes endless to-do list as well. And that also creates like a sense of overwhelm because you're not just caring for yourself, you're caring for, for your children and, and yeah. trying to navigate this, this new way of being. So can you talk about the epidemic um, of overwhelm and some simple strategies that we could do to help with this feel feeling? Yeah, sure. So I think overwhelming motherhood happens because again, it's like, I just want to go back to what we were just saying and this hustle and modern life that we live in. And it's really, I mean, you think of this, the moment you start school, it's like this term holiday, you know, this exam will work towards passing that exam. And then we get to high school, uni, it's all the same work promotion. And it's the same with motherhood. Mm. So, you know, we think that that's what we should be looking to. So we get pregnant and we go, okay, well, what does everybody else do? 
Mm. They buy the pram, they buy the cot, they paint the room, you know, everything. And it's like very rarely do we talk about what's going to happen in your head and in your heart when that baby arrives. Mm. We don't really prepare for the baby and and the the new version of ourselves that's coming. Mm. Um, And, you know, also baby sensory classes come in, then we've got to do swimming and then, you know, all the other, you know, things that we should be doing, we should be walking them and do we all of the pressure and the different parenting models that come into play. And I think, um, you know, again, slow living really helps us to see that actually what we need is a lot of space. We just need time together. Kids don't need a lot. They don't really want to be rushed around from sensory class to, you know, to sports classes and and all the rest of it. Um, That's actually for us a lot of the time, particularly when they're young. And, you know, I I think it's the social side. And I think what we don't realise as mothers is that there's this thing called matrescence. And matrescence is the evolution and the birth of a mother when she, when she, and it happens every time we have a baby. Um, Same as adolescence, you know, you go from child to woman or, you know, child to adult, you go from maiden to mother when you have a baby. And there's so much that changes. We change financially. Our situation often changes. Um, We change our status because mothers are viewed differently. Um, And even, you know, as we get older as well, um, we, you know, suddenly have to do look a certain way, can't wear that, this sort of thing. We should be bouncing back too much pressure. We change from, you know, baby brain is part of matrescence. Being, you know, the the shock of being sleep deprived, it all um, is an evolution of us. And, um, you know, our modern society says when something feels wrong, you just keep going, keep moving, keep doing, doing, doing. But if we sat down and just, you know, built our relationship with our children and didn't worry about all the external pressure hard to do Um, but yeah the practical side of things is one of the things that really worked for me the best was um, you know you're tired you've got a baby you've got young kids you're sleep deprived in some way or other Um, and I just changed my language around that of course I'm tired but Okay, let's just accept that. Of course, I'm tired. Let's, let's instead of saying, oh, hey, how are you? I'm busy. I'm tired. Hey, how are you going? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm getting there. You know, um, I'm doing my best. And just changing that narrative of, um, you know, pushing and, you know, wearing that badge of busy, like it's some, um, like that's, that means we must be doing a good job. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you can yeah. see that I get very ranty and I'm <laughs> no, very so, passionate about this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I I think so many people can resonate. Like everyone yeah. feels that pressure to to be busy or to look busy because mm. in society, if you're not, then you're deemed lazy and yeah, or unimportant. Unimportant, exactly. Yeah. And you can even if you're not a parent, like if you you are still, um, you know, can be super busy with work and you feel like you have to prove yourself and always be productive. And if you're not being productive, no matter whether you're a parent or not, sometimes you feel really guilty, like to take time out for yourself or to rest. Or if you're, you know, not always hitting those goals, you feel less sort of, I guess, superior to your peers who might be like seemingly doing it all. And (laughs) um excelling in life succeeding or however that sort of looks to to you or you feel like it looks and so there's a guilt that's associated with resting there's a guilt associated with taking a pause and taking some time out and I guess um I would love for you to sort of speak on the importance of taking the pause and the rest because I know that can really get overlooked and I myself I'm a bit like that like I feel if I do take um, a lot of like some time out, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I could be doing this in the business or I, I could be doing that. Like there's all, because there's always something to do. Like there's, there's the to-do list never ends and you've got to sort of just look at it and be like, well, there's always going to, 
even when you finish that, there's always going to be something else to add on to that. So we yeah. really need to sort of be able to slow down and take those pauses or else we won't and we get to burnout. And I've been there and I see multiple clients with burnout. Like that is one of the, it's not like, I guess the number one, but one of the main reasons um, women come to see me with their hormonal imbalances and gut imbalances. And it all sort of escalates into or has been through this sort of pushing themselves in this sort of burnout as well. Yeah, totally. I think we can totally flip the script on rest as being something that we have to earn. And that's what we're really doing when we're ticking off to do's, right? We're like, Mm -hmm. if I do this, then I'll be able to rest. But in fact, thinking of it, I can't do those things unless I rest. Mm. So actually resting is your best productivity tool. And I know you talk about like cyclical living, which I love as well. And that means that, you know what, men's hormonal cycles are what, 24 hour cycles. So Mm. they are a bit more like mobile phones. You can plug them in and they charge up and they wake up with hundred percent. Overnight, (laughs) they sleep, they get up and they go again. Yeah. (laughs) But women aren't like that. We have hormonal no. cycles that are all over the place. And so if we honoured that more, mm. if we actually honoured that time that we need to rest, you know, we get in our period, I'm feeling really cranky. Maybe I should go to bed early. Take some of that Absolutely. rest. You'll find that you can be more productive than any man. Oh, totally. <laughs> in the other phases of your life, when you're ovulating and when you're in, you know, the, the luteal phase, when you're just like, wow, I've got to go for it. Absolutely. You can get a lot of stuff done, but you can't get a lot of stuff done unless you rest. Exactly. So I think self-care, well, rest is self-care and self-worth in action. And you don't see big CEOs of companies doing, doing, doing. They've got strategies around making sure that they get rest, making sure that they eat healthy, making sure they get time for their families. Yeah. You know, so it's not like it's not like working more is going to get you further. In fact, figuring out ways to do, you know, your work in a more effective way um, yeah. will get you much, much further. So it's really about yeah, flick, flipping that script on rest being something that we have to earn. Mm, Totally. And I think you brought up a really good point there about, you know, listening to your body and sort of tuning in its natural cycles and its natural rhythms, because it will tell you. And it's when you start ignoring those signs and symptoms, that's when you get to the stage of burnout, because you're pushing through this really intelligent communication that your body's trying to tell you to slow down and to rest. And if you just listen to that innate wisdom, then you will be able to sort of replenish, be much more productive because when you like push keep pushing 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 and reach a state of complete you know burnout adrenal fatigue whatever you would want to call it then you're out of action for a long time and the other thing is that the work that you do is not your best quality like it's it's not great um you know outcomes in any means so definitely I think changing the script and tapping in to your innate wisdom and your body's wisdom so that you can really sort of tap into that cyclical living as a, as a woman is an amazing sort of tool as well. And like, as I mentioned, I, like, I see a lot of clients who, who do come to me, they're utterly exhausted when they get um, to my clinic and it's not always because of their physical health. Like there's not always, um, yeah, something that we can say, you know, you're, hypothyroid even though most of them are that come utterly exhausted but (laughs) can't think of something on off the top of my head right now um but it's often because they're they're constantly stressed and anxious and a lot of that is contributed to not having healthy boundaries when it comes to others and themselves so can you talk on this and how do we know if i guess overwhelm is a byproduct um of not having healthy boundaries and I guess how we can set like some practical advice on how to set healthy boundaries for ourselves and for others. Yeah, sure. So boundaries are, you know, it's really you've got to think of a boundary. Like people go, I've, I can't have boundaries. I, I struggle to say no, or I don't want to let people down. But actually a boundary is just really you saying, this is what I can manage. And this is my container that I need to hold myself in to protect my well-being and my time and my energy Mm -hmm. so first of all the first step to holding good boundaries is to know what your priorities are for your life Mm -hmm. because if you don't know what you need to say yes to you you'll just say yes to everything and then you can't say no 
But when something is so important to you, when you're so certain of what you're trying to achieve with your life, then it's much easier to say no. And it's not because you're trying to disappoint or let anyone down. Um, So again, going back to the mobile phone analogy, I think of myself as instead of trying to schedule myself in 100% of my day is booked out and planned, let's aim for like 70 or 80%, you know, so we've got that space in the day. And just because, you know, it's so easy to say, well, you know, I, I don't do things on a Tuesday afternoon, but as soon as someone asks you, can you do this on a Tuesday afternoon? Oh, I've got, I've got, um, I've got nothing on. I have to say yes, because I've got no reason to say no, but on Tuesday afternoon, maybe that's your day where you just, you know, cook a fresh meal and go to bed early. And if that's a priority, if, you know, I'm just using a very basic example, but if you hold that as time for you, like that counts, you know, like that counts, like time to clear your space, do some cleaning or whatever it is, just being at home for all the things that you never have time for. Um, really? Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that if you don't practice being able to voice your boundaries, then people don't know. It's it's not always, you may feel that people are taking advantage of you and pushing your boundaries, but if they don't know what they are, then they're not really. <laughs> so I think that's sort of about setting boundaries with yourself as well and being able yeah. to sort of voice how you're feeling, you know, what your schedule is, because once you become more confident and comfortable um, voicing that, then you will feel so much better in yourself. Because as then if you keep saying yes to things you don't really want to do, it builds this resentment and yeah. that resentment is exhausting. And like we were talking about that sort of full burnout stage, with all of that resentment and constantly doing things that you don't want to do. Like it's just this sort of perpetuating sort of cycle that you get yourself in. So I love that you were saying about know your values, know what you want to do, because when it comes to somebody, you know, coming in and saying, Hey, Tuesday afternoon is suits me to do this. And you've scheduled that for yourself and that's your value. And that's what you really know that you need to do to replenish each week. Then you can be confident and strong and saying, Oh, sorry, that doesn't, that day doesn't work for me and scheduling another day. Mm. I think, and it's also that sort of the pressure of, you know, not wanting to let other people down, but at the same time, you're letting yourself down. So where's your priorities there? Yeah. (laughs) You've got to prioritize yourself. Yeah, that's right. And, and I like what you said, like it is about taking personal responsibility in a way. It's not other people's responsibility to hold your boundaries for you. You have to, you have to get really confident in, in that. And like you said, if you just let other people kind of walk all over you, actually, you know, you teach people how to treat you. Right. So yeah. I yeah, agree. yeah, totally agree. So, do you have any like simple solutions that w- people could implement if they're listening to this and saying, "Yeah, I know I don't have you know great boundaries. I don't put them in place. Like, what's like the first step that they could do today to help build that fence, build the the boundaries around them when it comes to, I guess, people that are close to them. Like, often people hate saying no to to loved ones. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, well, again, first thing is to get clear on your priorities, understand why you're going to be saying no to some things and then have a couple of like canned responses, like just to get practice with it. Mm-hmm. And so things like, you know, hey, you can just say, oh, look, I've really got to check my diary. Things have been in a state of flux. Or you could be really honest and say, um, I haven't been feeling great lately. I need to take a bit more time and have a bit more space for myself at the moment. You know, hope you understand. I mean, people will probably get a little bit uncomfortable if they're used to you just dropping everything all the time. Mm. Um, but it starts with a little bit of a little bit of practice. Mm. Then the other thing you can do is really go, okay, well, I'm not quite ready to completely say no, but I could figure out in my mind, don't just automatically say yes. Give yourself a bit of a moment, like I said, with that script of like, let me check. I just, can I get back to you? But also figure out, well, if I can't say completely no, what could I say yes to and offer an alternative? Mm. So I'm not available on Tuesday. I've, I've actually got to do some other stuff at home, but I'd love to help you, you know, in this way. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So I am. Um, yeah. I used to find it really hard to say no, to be honest, because I was sort of yeah. brought up with the narrative that, um, like my mum used to say like, oh, you're, you're really strong. You know, you can, you can deal with so much. And it was great because it was motivating and everything, but I've, I've sort of taken that yeah. on. And if people can't do something or they're struggling, then I feel like I have to go in and help them. And yeah. probably that's why I landed in the career I am. <laughs> 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 just reflecting on that actually no but like it, you know I, I feel responsible for people sometimes where I shouldn't and mm -hmm. so it used to be really hard for me to say no because I used to put myself I'm, I'm quite empathetic I'd put myself in their shoes and say oh look they're struggling I've I'm, yeah. I've probably got a little bit more energy or support around me right now so you know why not I might as well just go and do it but it, it did it really led me down this track of of feeling a bit resentful because I was then feeling exhausted and I was taking on all of their energies yeah. so I've I really had to strengthen my no muscle and it is a practice and at first it it is hard because you're so used to being able to say yes to everything but now yeah. I'm really like mostly I'm not going to say all the time but I am mostly comfortable with saying no and my um my method is just to say the truth like and a lot of yeah. my friends get that now and they're amazing like they know that I don't go out and party hard because I can't be bothered and I'll be <laughs> tired so I'm they're like do you want to come out and I'm like nah nah it'll be too late and they're like okay cool no worries we'll, we'll do lunch next week and I'm like yep that suits me better like yeah. just being really upfront and honest has has worked for me which which I like because I don't even have to strain my brain of thinking of an excuse. I'm just like, no, yes. And this is why, because I don't want to. And yeah. sometimes it can be more stressful trying to think of an excuse and then remember what you said and, and all of that. Yeah, yeah that's right. You yeah. Can sort of like not even give people lengthy explanations, just say, oh, yeah. I just can't make it that that day or that Tuesday or whatever we keep picking on Tuesday but, <laughs> but just to go with the theme you know like I think just just being really simple with the answers yeah absolutely yeah that's right and a couple of things that I wanted to just add there because I think it's really relevant is um sometimes when you say yes to someone or you fix things for them you're actually not helping them as much as if you did mm -hmm. say no like if absolutely sometimes they need you to say no yeah. um and yeah then also like it's it's totally okay to say no that's the other thing right like it doesn't have to be confrontational and if you say oh yeah I can do that thing in three weeks like think to yourself if that was tonight would I want to do that I wouldn't probably have the energy for it and now you're actually letting that person down more by saying yes and then cancelling later yeah Just, you know same thing being really 100%. honest I yeah. would rather somebody say to me no than sort of string me along and then cancel last minute because that's way more frustrating. And if yeah. people are like, no, I'm just not up for it, like now, maybe never. <laughs> like yeah. I'd rather just know that and be yeah. like, oh, that's that's great, you know, because then you can move on as well. You can, if yeah. you do, if you do need to seek help from somebody else, you can go and do that or yeah. fill your schedule, whatever that may be. So yeah, I think that's a really, really important point. Yeah. And um like we talked briefly at the start about um, like bringing this slow movement into family life. Yeah. And when it comes to a family unit, I guess, why is slow living so important? And how do you actually teach kids to live slow when we do live in this really fast paced world and all of their mm. our friends are probably going to a million different sports and after school activities and doing a lot of things like how do you sort of embrace that as a family unit well actually I again flipping the script on that one is that kids live slow they naturally are in the moment they're naturally absorbed with what they're doing and we actively my kids do swimming because I think that's very important mm. um, and then the only other activities that they ever do is if they ask us like hey mum can I do soccer hey mum can I do cricket or something like that and that's because um, we spend a lot of time at home and or, you know, out and about, like we can be a bit more flexible. And I find that particularly my preppy, he started school this year. He's more tired. He's He likes to just come home and chill out and completely let go of all of that stuff. And he even if he did say, oh, I want to do cricket, um, every afternoon trying to get him ready for cricket like it's just a battle it just takes that that easiness of it and then 
you know what we can do cricket we've got neighborhood kids that we can play with um I live right next to a soccer field so I'm quite lucky from that sense we can go out and run around but it opens up the space for them to be creative and get lost in the moment and be bored and come up with their own things and um yeah so that that's my thoughts on that and then Maggie Dent I don't know if you've ever heard of her she's a really amazing parenting educator yeah A, a little while ago I listened to one of her podcasts and she said extracurricular activities you see this kind of like kids like little ones from like age three and four and then kind of like up to you uh, up to nine or whatever they do something every day like their parents have got them in so many extra correct curricular activities and then as they get to sort of 12 13 14 that drops away so that they can focus on their studies and she said she would actually prefer to see it the other way a lot more time and space for the younger ones Mm -hmm. and when the kids get older and more you know more clear on what they actually like to do for sport It's actually very um, helpful for kids that are older, you know, teenagers to be engaged in sport because it's stress relief from study. It's getting them outside of their school environment so that they're not stuck in the cliches and the bullying and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I would say ultimately young kids teach us how to live slow. (laughs) Absolutely. I've noticed that Like, I've got two boys or twin boys, they're nine. They're very, they like to be active and they love to be busy. And I feel that that may have almost been a little bit of my fault when they were really young (laughs) to get them out of the house. Like obviously with twins, it's, it's challenging on your own. So you can't just go to an open park. So I would go every day to a different play center that was sort of like locked in I did have them in a lot of activities to entertain them and I wanted to burn the energy out because they were boys so I was constantly on the go with them but it did it it was exhausting it was I think it was really tiring and the other thing is they weren't used to a because they're twins being on their own and trying to entertain themselves so they've always had somebody else and b they weren't used to not having activities organized for them so when I did slow down everything I I came to this realization and I was like no you know we're just going to scrap everything because like you said it's a challenge to get here there and everywhere with Mm. with kids um they were like, oh, well, what do we do? What are we doing tomorrow? Like I'm bored type thing. And I I remember something like my grandma always used to me when I'd say as a kid, if I ever said I'm bored, she'd go, oh, only boring people are bored because you can't come up with your own creativity and your own fun, right? So then I was like, well, you've got to, you know, come up with your own creativity and your own fun. And it, I think that is really um, a, a great sort of exercise for intelligence to be able to come up with that sort of creativity for yourself. And now I've noticed they naturally have slowed down as in when they're out skating or surfing or doing soccer or whatever, like they're going for it, but they, we have only, they only choose one sport that they want to do per year. So like this year it's soccer, but the skating, surfing, all of those, like we do that as, you know, just whenever it's not like this forced curriculum. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's, it's, um yeah, it's really good. We speak at the start of the year, like what sport do you want to do? That's just what we're going to focus on and not have every afternoon packed because you can only keep up with it for so long as a mum too. Like it exactly. You that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. You know, when they don't feel like going or um, yeah, running around, it's got to suit your whole family not just keeping the kids entertained Mm -hmm. and they're not actually I know there's a lot of pressure like that they'll miss out or they won't be good or that you know whatever Mm -hmm. but that's actually also probably not the case Um, you'll allow them to discover what they like and slowing down and living a slow life doesn't necessarily mean that your kids aren't allowed to be energetic or you know active Mm -hmm. definitely but opening up the space for them to be you know active without the structure Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like you said, like, you know, soccer training or whatever, there's rules and things. I've just yeah. done a whole day of listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, you've got to figure out what works for your family. But, um, yeah. yeah, I think as having one or two things is totally enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it all starts piling up, especially if you have, like, multiple kids at different ages, different genders, yes. like, yes. that's exhausting. I'm lucky both of mine are just in the same soccer team, so it's the same training, <laughs> the same game, we're done. <laughs> yep, amazing. Yeah, it's good. Uh, well, thank you so much. You've really um, shared some great insights on the episode today, so I hopefully 
um, all of our listeners as well. Some things might have, you know, struck them <laughs> to I hope so. Buy <laughs> them to live a little more slow. I know I need to be very um, cautious and more aware of what how I structure my life as well. I I do tend to overschedule a lot of things, trying to get everything achieved and everything done. But I know that it's actually very detrimental to our mental, emotional and physical health. So it's yeah. definitely something I've become a lot more aware of in the last few years. And like I said, even with my children and everything. So it's it's definitely um, a, a wonderful movement that you're doing. So thank you for sharing. No worries. Thank you so much. And it is so easy to get stuck in mm -hmm. suddenly I'm overscheduled again. You've got to be really, uh, yeah, slow living is really something that you have to be really mindful and intentional about because the, you know, the default is that hustle mode. So yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> doesn't happen and, by accident. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I do feel like the days that I know are busy days and especially if I'm switching from say, like I'm studying a master's at the moment as well. So if I'm going from studying to my business work or whatever it may be, I try to break that up with like either it'll be a walk in the middle of the day, like just to get some fresh air and just to slow everything down because yeah. we can only be running at, you know, full ball, 100% so much of the day like you you do you burn out and you get that brain fog like you get that inflammation that all, all of the things that come with that so I either like try to reset myself and calm the nervous system down by a nice walk or I do what I call micro meditation so I'll go and do like a five minute mini meditation between each task and oh, that way it's yeah it's just like an accumulation of small meditations but it's just so helpful and resetting to to get back into self get back into the parasympathetic state and just into your breath and your body and mm -hmm. and not being so like drawn to all of the external things that we have to do so yeah that's yeah. what I do to <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you so much. And um, I look forward to following your journey with Slow Living. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.